From our seven Tasmania studios, your nightly news with Kim Miller begins now. Good evening everyone. First tonight, a victim survivor of pedophile nurse James Griffin has told the Commission of Inquiry she was advised by child safety officers she needed to change her behaviour when around him. Tiffany Skeggs described the pedophile's grooming practices as textbook while calling for lasting changes to protect children in state care. An uncomfortable admission. I saw him as a hero, I guess, and it pains me to admit that. Tiffany Skeggs, one of those to blow the whistle about paedophile nurse James Griffin, today telling her story. Meeting him through netball, she says the abuse began when she was 12. His grooming processes were textbook perfect. If you go and read all the textbooks that have been published on grooming, he did every bit of it. Ms Skeggs emotional as she described how he turned her away from close family, including her nan told me that I had to choose between him and her. I lost that relationship because she was trying to protect me from him. His behaviour towards her was a subject of discussion in their community, but the concerns dried up. And they then stepped back and they're like, we stopped asking questions because everyone told us the phrase I'll hate for the rest of my life is, that's just Jim. Child safety eventually became aware. Ms Skeggs telling the inquiry an officer rang her while in year 10, saying their response put the responsibility on her. Her words to me was that I should not continue engaging in that behaviour, that I should know that it's inappropriate to sit on his knee. I need to change what's happening. After telling Griffin about the call, he said... He would deal with it. He works with child protection frequently and they'll believe anything he tells them. Mr Griffin died by suicide in 2019 while on bail on child sex offences. Ms Skeggs criticised that decision, saying she told police at the time he was likely to take that course of action. I had given them the evidence of him stating that, to quote his words, I'll kill myself before I go to prison making a call for lasting change after her emotional appearance. There are ministers in our government that are responsible for those people and they are still in their positions of power. Some of them dismissed and groaned at me. Showing the scale of the problem, an admission from the CEO of the state's northern hospitals. He says he only became aware of the extent of the allegations through this week's hearings. That triggered to me thinking that this, this is, this should have been investigated further at the time and reported at the time. John Hunt, 7 Tasmania News. Tasmania's public health emergency declaration ends at midnight and restrictions we further scale back. Some with health concerns say they're worried, but businesses are optimistic and preparing to set sail. Dormant for two years, Tasmania's cruise industry is coming back to life as COVID-19's unprecedented waves begin to settle. This is a, a, a chance for them to really um, double down during the peak season and make sure they fill up the coffers that have been so empty over the last couple of years. Members of the tourism sector attending a workshop to discuss future voyages. 17 million people have been cruising somewhere in the world in over 100 countries in the last 18 months. So Australia is opening at a time where a lot of these protocols have been very well tested. It comes as the public health emergency declaration expires at midnight. We're moving to living with COVID and we encourage Tasmanians to remain diligent, to look after themselves and keep themselves healthy and well. Many are celebrating the return to normality. We've been through some really hard times down at Salamanca Market. We were shut for a prolonged period. Uh, we were very restricted, uh, so this is really welcome news. But just because the rules are ending doesn't mean the new cases are. Nearly 1,300 more recorded today as another two Tasmanians lose their lives to the virus. Some say the move contradicts a jump in infection rates. It sends a, uh, the wrong message to the community that COVID is over. With the BA5 variant beginning to appear in the community, industry experts say it's the vulnerable and immunocompromised Tasmanians who are fearing for their future. 
they are really worried about what this does mean for that for themselves, their families. Other than in health settings, the government won't be imposing any restrictions on Tasmanians, leaving issues like masks up to them. Brianna Boylan, 7 Tasmania News. Australia's energy market regulator has backed the Marinus Link in its latest integrated system plan, calling the project a vital part for resource diversity. But concerns over who will pay for construction of the giant cable still haven't been answered. Powering the future of renewables across the country, the Australian energy market operator confirming the Marinus Link is urgently needed to further reduce prices and secure capacity for the national grid. This is a milestone event with the independent regulators saying that Marinus Link uh, is urgent. Uh, this is very good news. In the recently released integrated system plan, the AEMO says the link would deliver $4.5 billion in positive net market benefits. Economists say a fair funding model between Tasmania and the other states needs to be established. Why should the people of Tasmania pay the cost in the form of higher electricity bills when in fact the benefit comes to mainland Australia? Saying there's a potential domino effect from cost and time blowouts. We know there's risk of a 30, 40, 50 percent cost blowout and we know these are really complicated engineering projects. Mainland Australia wants what Tasmania has which is cheap, reliable, renewable energy and of course the rest of Australia wants to get that. Labor wants clarification on how much Tasmanians will pay calling for a deal that doesn't take taxpayers for a ride. Is it the case that Tasmanians are going to have to pay for half of the costs of the link but only get 6% of the benefit. That's the risk I think at this stage. The state government says discussions with their federal counterparts are progressing well and remain adamant a deal won't be done unless it benefits Tasmanians. Mark Zeta, 7 Tasmania News. A Tasmanian man has relived the moment he was brutally hurled from a balcony while battling homelessness. He's one of many residents getting a second chance under a safe roof, a place aimed at tackling Tasmania's housing crisis. In a case of mistaken identity, Scotty never imagined a knock at the door would nearly lead to his death. When they threw me off a one-storey building, they burst into a slab of cement, cracked me veins. 27 weeks in hospital, I suppose. The 59-year-old spent more than five years on and off the streets, exposed to numerous horrors. Oh, baseball bats, cricket bats, beer bottles crashed over your head, money stolen out of your pocket, pissed on, shit on. But he never lost sight of what was most important, finding a place to call home. I thought around the corner there's going to be something else there somewhere and I'm determined to find it and I did when I, when I came here. Now a well-loved character among his community at Mountain View in Glenorchy. I'm Grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm Grandpa Scotty. Its operating costs are funded by Hobart City Mission donors. The refurbished hotel offers independence. So they've got somewhere safe and secure. Then we provide the support that wraps around that so that you have opportunities to think about the things that you've probably pushed to one side. 32 residents live on site helping get their lives on track. A rewarding experience for staff too. It's so good to be able to see someone um, or work with someone when they're at their lowest and know that you've played a very small part in helping them get somewhere they want to get to. It's estimated that on any given night, more than 250 Tasmanians are sleeping rough in the south of the state as the housing crisis continues to bear down on vulnerable community members. It's the bigger picture of things. We can't build houses quick enough. We know the building materials aren't there. We know the trades aren't there. So it's a much bigger issue than just let's just build houses. Scotty is now just four months shy of his 60th birthday, a milestone he thought he might never reach. I don't plan on doing it. Not bloody worth it, mate. Still a lot left to give. Grace Evans, 7 Tasmania News. Daniel Morecambe's parents have vowed to help educate the community in their quest to put an end to child sexual abuse. Denise and Bruce Morecambe spoke at the Changing Futures Forum today, joining agencies from across the state in a united front aiming to grow awareness. We just see that uh, primary prevention is the way forward. Um, it, it's about stopping the abuse before it happens. In the past, the children have been going to people reporting what's happened and 
and the authorities haven't been doing anything, but we need to stop that. The mm. authorities need to get the perpetrator and these people need to be punished. They're pushing for national standards to be adopted while helping rewrite the, rewrite the framework for those in vulnerable settings. Devonport is building up for one of the biggest sporting showdowns in the city's history when the strikers take on A-League giant Wellington Phoenix on home turf. 5,000 fans are tipped to fill Valley Road for the Australia Cup clash, but there's a race against time to bring the venue up to standard. Being drawn into a David and Goliath battle wouldn't normally be cause for celebration, but the Australia Cup, formerly the FFA Cup, is a different beast. It is the yardstick for football in this part of the world. It'll be the first time a Tasmanian team faces an A-League side in the knockout competition. But Devonport has a secret weapon. Goalkeeper Keegan Smith used to play for their opponent, Wellington Phoenix, and remains in touch with his old teammates. Probably a bit of ribbing out there on the field. The club's now rushing to double the grounds lighting, so it's up to television standard. Fixtures featuring A-League sides typically receive special coverage from broadcasters, giving the coastal city exposure nationally and across the Tasman. It creates huge exposure, and even this year we have players that you know, come here to play simply because they want to be part of a, a winning culture and a winning club. If there's any team which can cause what fans call a cup set, it's Devonport. The Strikers are the only Tasmanian team to have ever made it to the second round in the competition's nine-year history. Two and a half thousand fans braved atrocious conditions when the side first achieved the feat in 2016. Twice as many are tipped to pack Valley Road when the Phoenix come to town. I think it'll be 99% uh, Strikers fans. You see upsets, you see the underdog taking out big opponents. It'll be largely standing room only though. The ground's new grandstand won't be ready until later in the year. We'll fit them in somehow, don't worry about that. A time and date's yet to be revealed, but it'll be going ahead, rain, hail or hopefully shine. Tom Johnson, 7 Tasmania News. Tasmanians on electricity concessions will receive a $180 discount on their bills under a new assistance package that starts tomorrow. The state government says it will help future-proof 90,000 people on concessions against bill shock. We know that uh, many Tasmanians are doing it tough and it's a tough time of year because it's winter. Uh, so as the bills roll out from the 1st of August, uh, that will automatically reduce on those energy bills going forward. So I think key to, to making this package work is improving people's energy literacy and that is an important component of it. The discount will cover the entire bill increase for low to medium power use customers. A spectacular laser show will light up the night sky above Bishano from tomorrow. Running for all of July, the Bishano Beams is expected to attract interstate visitors as well as Tasmanians embarking on an East Coast trip for the school holidays. But organisers are warning tourists to book accommodation early or risk missing out. There are three places that I checked yesterday. One is walking into July at 91% occupancy, 170 and 171%. Now these are unheard of figures. The family-friendly event is free and gets underway each night from six. Our connection with old Devils coach Cameron Joyce was a big selling point for Tasmania's top AFLW draftee. Claire Ransom will be in familiar company under Joyce at the Gold Coast Suns, while the Giants have recruited a player with a perfect record at Olveston. A devil sees the sun. Doesn't really seem real at the moment. North Hobart's first AFLW draftee was also Tasmania's highest, taken at pick 34. The classy midfielder had a handy link in Devils turned Suns coach Cameron Joyce, who helped build the girls' NAB League side from the ground up. Girls footy in Tassie was a bit slow to start off with, so it took a few years for it to get going, but um, I think we really hit the ground running. And obviously being able to play in the NAB League as part of the Tasmanian Devils, I'm um, really progressed our move through that. Snapped up soon after, Megan Gaffney, the Olveston Robins' first AFLW draftee, is off to the Giants. When you hear your name called out, it just all of a sudden becomes real. GWS will want to replicate her local record. Gaffney's never lost a game playing for Olveston for five seasons straight. The small forward is seen as a missing piece of the Giants' puzzle. My speed is my strength, so um, yeah, just creating a little bit of energy for the team, a bit of chaos. I think she really fits her needs, basis for them, that really small 
small forward tackle pressure role. Launceston's Madison Brazendale will join Gaffney at the Giants. She's also known for her speed, having an athletics background. While Devonport's Lily Johnson will suit up for Port Power, having moved to West Adelaide this season. Straight through by Lily Johnson, the local from Tasmania. The state's namesake partner, North Melbourne, didn't take any Tasmanians, but the Devils coach says the league's expansion is largely why. That relationship's fine, especially for Brazendale and Gaffney. Like that was sort of almost guaranteed to get to GWS because of the amount of picks they had, whereas North Melbourne being an existing club in the AFLW meant they only had two or three picks. For these draftees, any club is a dream come true. Good evening. 14 was the state's top today across Burnie and Devonport. 13 in Hobart and Launceston. Strawn and Grove 11, 13 in Lowhead and 12 in St Helens. On the close-up shows, overcast conditions with low-level cloud about the southwest. Further out, low-level cloud is seen across the southern coastline of Australia, while the rest of the country is relatively cloud-free. Tomorrow shows a high to the northwest of Tasmania in the Bight. Southwest to south easterly winds tomorrow, 10 to 20 knots, swells up to 5 metres in the west and south and below 1 metre in the north. A road weather alert is current for the central plateau, Midlands and upper Derwent Valley forecast districts. Tomorrow's forecast now 12 across Hobart and Hewanville, a morning frost then partly cloudy for Campania. In the north, 12 in Launceston, partly cloudy about Devonport and Georgetown. Burnie and Wynyard tomorrow, partly cloudy, showers in Strawn. 12 across St Helens and Swansea and cloudy in Port Arthur. Looking ahead to the three-day forecast now, Saturday light showers about the west and far south, Sunday showers about the west and far south, mostly sunny elsewhere, and Monday light showers for the southwest, otherwise fine and sunny elsewhere. Capital cities 19 and sunny in Perth tomorrow, Adelaide partly cloudy and 27 in Darwin. And currently Hobart mostly cloudy and 7, Launceston partly cloudy and Devonport mostly cloudy and 9. That's all in weather tonight, Kim. OK, thank you very much, Jackie. And that is all your news for this Thursday. Thanks for joining us. Good night.